Let's be real. We all should take a break from alcohol from time to time. It's good for our overall health, but can help with sleep and anxiety. And more sleep, less anxiety, are great things. But during those breaks, you may hang out with some friends and want to feel included. Maybe you want a beer with your burger off the grill. Luckily, Athletic Brewing is making non-alcoholic beers that taste just like world-class craft beers. Athletic are brewing styles like IPAs, stouts, sours, and lagers, but all are non-alcoholic. These award-winning, great-tasting beers are also vegan-friendly. There's a reason Athletic is one of the fastest-growing companies, let alone breweries, in the country. You can get Athletic Brewing NA beers delivered right to your door as well. Go to unitedwedrink.com slash athletic and start shopping. Grab a sixer of an IPA or one of their limited edition brews that are constantly rotating with new styles. And right now you can get free shipping on any order when you buy two six packs or more. No code needed. Just add two to your cart, go to checkout, and there you go. Free shipping. Take a break from alcohol with something that tastes great. Try Athletic Brewing today by going to unitedwedrink.com slash athletic. Athletic Brewing. Beer fit for all times. The opinions and statements in this podcast do not represent those of the hosts, employers, co-workers, family, or imaginary friends. Now enjoy the show. Happy hour? More like amateur hour. Welcome to United We Drink. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast that makes really bad predictions, at least from half of it. Uh, Welcome to United We Drink right here on unitedwedrink.com, as well as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, and wherever fine podcasts are found. My name is Mike Urevich, and I am never going to make real-world sports predictions two weeks, three weeks out from when uh, an episode comes out ever again. Mike, are you trying to say that the Phillies didn't win in five? They they did. They, in fact, did not win at all. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm so sorry, man, to to see that. uh, You know, obviously I was watching that and pulling for you, being uh, having no real dog in the hunt uh, other than wanting to see my buddy's team win the World Series. Uh, Things started off exactly how I, I had planned. Take take a split in Houston and then pounded them in the, the first home game. And then uh, it just all, <laughs> everything went off the rails with a no hitter and all of that. Well, Houston but, is pretty good. Uh, those, those guys, they have some pretty good baseball players there, regardless of the cheating scandal in the past. They, they, they've got some real gamers there. So it's no, it's no shame to go to the World Series. I will say that I am happy for Dusty Baker, and I will leave it at that. Uh, I'm sure. Well, Dusty is uh, well known to listen to the podcast. He's a big craft beer fan. <laughs> so, Dusty, when you're going out there, just know that Mike uh, Mike's sending you some love. <laughs> um, as as you can hear, Kevin Abbott is here. Uh, as as always, indeed, I, I am. Um, so yeah, outside of that, um, let's see, let's, let's talk about what we're drinking here to tonight, Kevin. What, what are you imbibing in? So uh, I've got something very interesting in front of me, which is the Hop Attack Double IPA. That was a beer we did for Lazy Dog Restaurant. It is a interesting program they do where they go to breweries all around the country and they come up with uh, four different breweries every quarter and they produce a, uh, a special beer that is brewed by Melvin Brewing. And they brew these recipes. It's kind of like a contract, but Melvin does have some conversation back and forth about the recipe with us. And we produced a double IPA for their uh, Hophead Arcade. 
specialty uh, four pack that just came out uh, a week or so ago, and I am really enjoying it. It is themed after Galaga. Mike, I don't know if you've seen this yet. Yeah, I, I saw the little video uh, that they put out about yeah, it. They're a really professional company. We love working with them. They've got a 30, 40 locations. I don't know what it is. They're all over the country. And uh, Melvin does all their house beers, and they produce these beers for them, for their beer club. And the beer club is a, a steal. I'm, I'm a member of it. It's almost nothing, and you get priority seating and all kinds of upgrades for everything. Plus, you get eight. You live right around the corner from from one. I live right around the corner, and every quarter I get eight 16-ounce uh, cans of some pretty darn good beers. So it's it's pretty cool. Uh, Ralph, uh, one of our brewers at Barrel Monks, he worked on this recipe with uh, with the guys at Melvin. And I think they knocked it out of the park. The beer turned out really, really nice. I'm, it's a shame I only have two cans. You can't buy that individual four pack. Like you get your your pack of your two of each of the four beers, and I can go there and have it on draft. I was going to ask, can just, you have it on draft? Yeah, it, it and uh, you can go and have it on draft while it lasts. There's only so much. I have been told, and they're probably just blowing smoke because I'm the guy from Barrel of Monks. But I have been told that the double IPA is doing really, really well and outselling everything at the uh, at the Boca location right now. So how, how long will it last? I don't know, but I'll certainly be here, uh, there, I should say, again this weekend, have another uh, another pint, because I'm really enjoying it. So do did they tell you that, uh, hey, this is going to be an IPA pack, you, you got to do an IPA, or was it up to you to do an IPA? So it's interesting. They come up with the concept, the theme of the release uh, well in advance so the one before this one was uh, all the like four different brewing schools all came up with uh with beer ideas so it's like a science lab kind of theme the one before that was all spy uh, themed so you had beers like secret plan and things of that nature so we knew the theme of being like classic retro gaming arcade gaming and then we pitched ideas of the kind of beers we wanted to do Okay. So we actually are the only ones that did an IPA. There's also an oh, Italian. Oh, okay. It's called the Hophead Arcade. All the beers have a hop note to them, probably more than they typically would be. Like I also have an Italian style Pilsner here. Uh, I have also another uh, Amber Lager that are both more probably higher higher hopped than they normally would be. So there was a good amount of that going on. But this is the biggest hoppiest beer. They said they'd never done a double IPA at 8.5% for one of these packs before because a lot of the beers are more introductory level beers. So they were really excited to do it and it's 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 working out really well. Very cool. Also love seeing Italian Pilsners more out there. I love that style. So I actually have that one here in front of me for my second beer of the night uh, from Knee Deep Brewing. And this one's kind of a... I forget the game that it's uh, referencing, but I want to say it's like a Super Nintendo uh, racing like game. Radmobile or Rad Racer? Rad Racer, yeah. yeah. Maybe Rad Radmobile was <laughs> that. That's from uh, Encino Man, <laughs> the, <laughs> the game uh, in like the convenience store. Yeah. Um, very cool. Um, well, well you're Deep, that's a brewery I haven't heard uh, from in quite a while. Well, we'll see what happens with you because I I recommended Copper Copper Point as the uh, the next local brewery in Florida they have to talk to. So. We'll yeah, see if they, you guys end up doing some work with them. They reached out to us. We're going to have a call with them in a couple of days. Good. You'll talk to Emma. She's she's awesome. She's a cool yeah. cool person, she, easy easy to work with, and really uh, brings a lot of energy. And also uh, just has done this so many times, it makes the whole process really easy. Oh, then I'm going to hate this. I hate energy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, very cool. Um, I'm. I'm drinking something uh, kind of silly and special here. I'm having a Speckaloo's cookie butter beer uh, from Hardywood Park uh, in Virginia that they brewed for Trader Joe's. Mm. This is, uh, I guess, uh, Speckaloo's cookie butter is a product that Trader Joe's makes. And uh, this is like their take on that product in beer form. It's an imp an imperial golden ale with toasted coconut, vanilla bean, and natural flavors. It's nine and a half percent. They sell uh, four packs, tall boys, 
uh, in the store. Um, I know I, I saw online that they had done this in previous years in like the 500 mil bottles for Trader Joe's, but I'd never seen it in previous years. I have seen Hardywood, um, uh, the gingerbread stout, uh, in past years there and bought like many bottles of that because it's fucking delicious. Um, I now think my, this is like the only way we get Hardywood Park beer in Florida is through Trader Joe's. Now, cookie butter beer, that's a tra- traditional Czech style, right? Exactly, yes. Okay, that's what I thought. A very, a very small region of the Czech Republic uh, called cookie butter. It's, it's spelled a little differently, but all one it's word. One, one word with an umlaut somewhere. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Uh, I, I, I believe it's like cookie butter or something like that. Um, sorry, bad comedy. Um, it's very tasty. Um, it's not, it is not overly sweet. It's got a good spice character to it and does not drink a bit like nine and a half percent. So it's, it's kind of scary in that sense. Um, I also, also have a uh, little glass of uh, Dad's Hat Rye Whiskey here, uh, which is made in Bristol, Pennsylvania, just outside of Philadelphia, which is also it's like five minutes from where I grew up um, that I am uh, continuing to drown my sorrows from uh, a World Series uh, with. Um, but yeah, we, we should, are going. Yeah. We should uh, name this the uh, the World Series Fallout episode of the United We Drink podcast. This is all about Mike drowning his sorrows and, and licking his wounds. And and we'll talk I'll talk a little bit about what I think that the team needs to do to improve on uh, next season like trying to sign Trey Turner maybe a big starting pitcher uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do all that um, but, but we won't. We won't do that at all. Um, what we are going to talk about is uh, something that Kevin proposed that I thought was a cool idea because I don't think we've ever mentioned, even like in passing, this topic on the show. And I don't know if many people outside of the industry really know about this. And that's kind of like uh, private labeling. You you refer to it as a term that I'd never heard before called big name, little name. Well, that, uh, that, re- that re- refers specifically to when you rebrand a beer. So you have an existing brand and you take that brand, you sell it to somebody and they use that same beer under a different name as a private label. That's a term I got from old friend of the show, uh, Phil Palmasano. And I assume it was the correct term. But the fact that you did not know what I was talking about and looked at me like I was a space alien, I'm now starting to think that he was trolling me to make me I seem foolish. I didn't look at you like you were a space alien. I looked at you because you are a space alien. Um, uh, the, so, yeah, I've just always uh, just called that straight up private labeling. Um, but, I mean, I know that there's tons of terms out there for things that I've never heard of before uh, or things that are just regional or weird, like fucking people who say pop. Um I you're one of those, those people, people, right? <laughs> I don't. You've never heard me say the term "pop," but I grew I up. With those I, I don't know if I, I like. I, <laughs> I'm not going to get into party store, uh, but <laughs> that is a very weird terminology or term that I learned from you. My my, um, en- my entire family thinks I'm highfalutin because I call it soda. It's a weird <laughs> place, man. It's weird. <laughs> moving on. Moving on. So, private label. Big, big name, little name. Um, this is something that I've dealt with. Uh, I deal with at the current brewery that I'm at. I've dealt with at my first brewery. Um, it's thing that I think that is becoming even more popular, especially with independent uh, restaurants, is they want a house brand. They want something that has their name on it and because they think that they, they can sell that so much um, I mean, we've, we make a couple private label beers for, uh, a, a hotel resort in Fort Lauderdale. There's a couple places that, uh, relabel our, our lager for draft with uh, like a specialty tap handle that we tap sticker that we make for them. And it's just a, a 
it is our lager that they get a, a cool name for blah 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 that these are the two different things that you can kind of do you can i guess make a place a beer uh or you can relabel something that you already make and there's a lot of different ways of going about doing this uh that i don't even know what's the the right place to jump in at this uh at well i have i have an idea there so We've done a lot of this. I, I can think of at least 15 examples of either making a beer specifically for one location or a chain or rebranding one of our current brands for them. And it almost always starts off. I, maybe we pitched one or two of these over the years, but it's almost always happens when a restaurant, a bar, what have you, comes to you. As a brewery, they know your sales rep well, they have a good rapport, and then they say exactly what you said, Mike. We want something that we can own here, and we want our own brand. And then the conversation starts. Okay, what are you looking for? Almost to a person that I've dealt with personally, they want their own beer. They want something that is brewed for them. Excuse me. They want something that's brewed for them that sometimes they want to in, uh, introduce like an ingredient or something that they're known for, but they want their own private beer. And it is very rare when you can pull that off because how many independents, especially restaurants, go through enough volume for a decent sized brewery to make a beer for them? And when we were very, very early on at Barrel Amongst and we were doing a lot of treatments of our regular beers. We said yes to everything because we needed business and we wanted business. And we quickly realized that we were going down a road that we did not want to continue going down. We did not want to be treating individual slims and half barrels to go out because this bar or restaurant wanted their, their special beer. But that's usually where the conversation has started for me. And it seems like you've had some of those experiences, Mike. Yeah, uh, I, I mean... This, going back to the first brewery days, we had not that, that many places, but uh, at least I can remember a handful that came to us and that started that. We want our own brand. Okay. Well, this is the minimum amount of beer that we can make, and that is X amount of kegs. Uh, can you go through that within three months? Because that would be your kind of date code window for that. No, we can't. Well, then we can't really do that. You see how how that works. And a lot of times you you bring some of them, most of them down to earth a little bit with mm -hmm. something like that. And they're like, oh, I didn't realize that. Uh, I didn't realize that you're that big. <laughs> like, we're not big. That's just the size of the system and how many kegs essentially come out of a batch like that. And then it becomes talking about that whole let's let's redo something and we got this we got that we can rename this there were a couple times though that we did make a special beer and we tried our best to then because we wanted that that spot so badly uh, and they said that they would bring in uh, other kegs that uh, like other brands of ours if we we did this so like all right let's let's make this and then we can have it on in our tap room as well, at, or we can, we, they're out of business. I, I can say stuff like this now, um, that we, we made a pale ale for a hotel and we're like, okay, we don't make this pale ale for anything else. And then we started doing a single hop, uh, series to let people see what, like, uh, the different dry hops with using a single hop were like, and, the Citra one was so popular that we turned it into its own pale ale brand, like a, a Citra dry hopped pale ale. And so we had a base pale ale that we sent out to just this one hotel. And then we would dry hop the fermenter with the Citra to make this other brand that we would have in-house and we would send out into distro. And at first it was okay, but then it got to be, I know, a pain to... To deal with for a while i don't know whatever became of that situation i was gone while we still had the uh i i, I believe when we still had the 
the whole thing going on. But I mean, trying to do stuff like that is a pain to juggle because you don't know how many kegs necessarily you're going to be taking out that are just going to be for the pale ale. And then now you want to, or that you're transferring to bright and then you got to dry hop the rest of it in FV. And it's, it's a whole lot of that stuff uh, well, where yeah. it's just easier to say, here's our IPA. Uh, we'll call it your Bob eat at Bob's uh, IPA. And, and that's where you end up at so often, but we try every one of these avenues, right? Because we want business. We are enticed by the idea of having multiple draft lines. And I've been offered, Oh, you'll have, if you do this, you'll, we only have six draft lines. You'll have four of the six. And we'll also put whatever package you want there. But we really want to make this happen. So you really rob Peter to pay Paul. You move stuff around. And you realize very quickly, at least, I'm sure there's plenty of people who have done this really, really well. And when we start talking about chains, it changes the conversation a lot. Because now we're talking volume. But with independent places and a 20 barrel or a 30 barrel or a 40 barrel system, it just becomes really, really tough. Now, you can go down the treatment route. And you can try to pull stuff off and do treatments or do dry hops like you talk about. And there are some benefits to that. Maybe you find a new brand out of it. Maybe you find a new treatment out of it. Maybe you're able to stock your tap room with more new interesting beers and you and you build some creativity out of it. That's really what you're trying to do there when you're trying when you essentially have excess volume that you're trying to figure out how to move it. And that's where you end up at. We had a really interesting situation early on. And speaking of uh, Mr. Mr. Palmasano, he was the one who was our sales rep at the time when he brought a, a restaurant to us in South Florida. And they wanted their own private label. They are an individual location. They were going to go through a half barrel a month right? <laughs> Best case scenario. They wanted their own beer. Even at that point when we were super new, we couldn't do something that small. So we came up with this idea that we were going to come up with these syrups, almost like you would do with like a traditional Berliner Weiss, right? Where you have the Woodruff syrup or the raspberry syrup, because that way we could like change the beer in some way. We could do it seasonally, or we could find a way to take our base beer and we could treat it on the on the back end at the actual location and we Wouldn't met that about be the front it end? uh well the back end for me at the very end of the cycle sure front end back end going uphill downhill i'm not sure anyway at the actual bar which is not i've never heard of anything when doing anything like that before and we thought it was a great a brilliant idea and we just could never figure it out right because now you're working with syrups syrups are sweet they add sugar to the beer no matter what but for a minute, for a hot minute, we thought we had a brilliant idea that just never really panned out. And they ended up just taking one of our regular beers, renaming it uh, for what it, you know, to, to be whatever their restaurant brand wanted. And then the other example I wanted to put forward is that we've been doing a private label, uh, one location. They're the only ones that receive it. It's exclusive to them. Beer for over a year and a half, almost two years now. And one of the things you do get when you have that conversation, Mike, and I appreciate what you were saying about educating people, uh, when someone comes to me and asks me my advice about these things, I will always say whatever volume they say they're going to go through, chop it in half immediately, yeah. no matter what it is. We're going to go through 14 half barrels a month. Okay, so let's start with this. When you go through less than seven, because that's where we're going to start at, can I make this work? And it's just the nature of the beast, right? It's just, it's just the nature of the business. People overestimate what they think they can go through. And we have struggled with this brand. We've kept up with it. We think it's a really good beer. We love the partnership we're having with them. But how sustainable is that long term when we're going through half the volume and sometimes lower than half the volume that was planned and keeping beer fresh? We want, we want that account. They're, they're, they're great for us and we respect them and we like the beer that we're making for them, but it, it becomes untenable sometimes at a certain point. Yeah. And I, I get what some of these places are going with. They're, they're small, they're independent. They want to work with other small independent companies that especially a local one, they're like, Hey, we're small, you're small. Let's work together. Let's make this. But it, it, 
even though they're they're adjacent industries, we're kind of two different industries to where small isn't really on the same level to one another. And it, it, it is a tough conversation to have because you do want to work with them. You, you, you might have like very similar ideals on, uh, on maybe they're like a farm to table type of thing. And you really like their, their morals on, on food and sustainability and whatnot. But at, at the end of the day, you're like, Hey, I got a 20 barrel system. Uh, it's 40, half kegs uh that we need we, you we're essentially going to make it's probably going to be somewhere between 32 and 40 kegs and there's a 30 day date or a uh, sorry three month date code on on this beer can you go through that amount of beer in three months and you, even in that case mike you've, you've got to store it do you really yeah. want to keg up 40 half barrels and sit them in your walk-in and let them slowly draw down over a three-month period? Is the extra volume that you go through that you have to produce there worth it when you could start scaling up one of the beers that you're doing regularly? I mean, these are all the conversations we're having at the brewery all the time because we have to have economies of scale, the the extra transfer, transfers that are involved in that, the extra movement, the extra cooperage that's tied up into it. That can really be a strain on a brewery. And at this point, when I'm talking with people and they are steadfast that this is the avenue they want to go down, is they want a beer produced for them and only for them, I'll recommend smaller breweries. I'll say, listen, here's a couple people you can go talk to. I don't know them necessarily. I just know they're on one or two or three barrel systems and they're local and they are in a position where they can make you a batch every three weeks. <laughs> and they can, and that volume will be very helpful for them. And it might be, as you were saying, now there's a symbiotic nature with small to small because they don't realize that even as a brewery, as, as our size breweries, we're manufacturers. We're not artisanal, you know, tiny nanos. And it's hard for them to, to parse that out. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the place that you're talking about without saying who you're talking about don't you make package for them as well no no did you no okay then i'm not thinking of the the same place no we, we've uh, we've never packaged any 100 percent private beer by the mean by the way of making a beer specifically for somebody we've okay. never been able to do package for them now that moves on I mean, into the next step of that right so we've had this conversation we've come to the conclusion that we can't do this or maybe they're a big account and we want to roll the dice give it a shot which is what we've done a couple times uh to different degrees of success and we say okay we've got a beer we make it's a regular rotation beer you can pick it up from your distributor at all times it's never out of stock but it's a beer that everybody else can have and now you're going to put in it your own name on it and we can give you a new tap sticker we can make it we'll go online and find someone with a the, uh, a uh, which a uh, 3D printer, and we'll make a new handle that isn't even a typical barrel amongst handle. And a lot of people go down that road, and even then, a lot of times they find that it's not that satisfying because their expectations of how much beer they're going to go through because it's a private label, at least to the customer, they think that oh, I've walked into this incredible, I don't know, pizza joint. It's my favorite place. I support it. And now they got their own beer. And they think that that beer is now going to sell hand over fist. And it tends to do exactly what that kind of brand, wheat beer, blonde ale, IPA would do, whether it was their beer or not. And we've seen a lot of that, too. I, I remember going to a joint down in the Keys. Uh, it, was, it was called category three grill it was in uh key largo and they had uh a category three ipa on tap and i was like that's not us we we don't sell to this this place because we had an ipa called category three uh and i asked i just without saying who i were for i was like who makes that uh like oh it's made specifically for us by anheuser-busch <laughs> and uh i'm like okay yeah, and yeah, that sounds about, that tracks come to find out it's it it was long hammer uh yeah uh, from um 
uh, what's not Red Hook, right? Um, and we we tried to work with them on like, hey, we're an actual Florida brewery. We make a beer called Category Three. Uh, it's an IPA, and like we can work together, and you can have this beer on it, 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 buy from our distributor. And they're like, no, we like this one. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> but for a long time, Long Hammer, anytime you saw, at least in South Florida, yeah, five, ten years ago, maybe a little bit longer, anytime you saw a house IPA, it was Long Hammer IPA. Yeah. That's just what it was. And uh, I, I actually think that one of the beers that I replaced with a Barrel of Monks branded beer house branded beer was a long hammer ipa at one point <laughs> so that's the snaking its tail or something something like that the uh the thing that <clears throat> um, excuse me uh the thing the thing that i i'm always kind of dumbfounded with is the idea that we can put this beer out that is the same exact beer Right, as sometimes some of our core beers, and you mentioned specifically lager. I've rebranded our blonde ale, I've rebranded our, our wheat beer, and our wheat is our flagship beer. Is it, is it uh, disingenuous? Is that a wrong thing, Mike, to take a beer out there and have a account say they make this specific? Because at the end of the day, they're usually saying whether they, they know it, the bartenders or what have you or not. They're saying, like they said it at the Category 3 grill, they make this specifically for us. Do you find that to be wrong, that things are being presented that way when it's not necessarily true? I, I think if, if it is portrayed that way, yes, I do find it disingenuous. Um, I, I don't think now, in that particular case, there could have been a whole lot of telephone going on and, and the whole story was lost by the time it got to the bartender. And this is just what they, they understand. I, I've been to a local restaurant here that had a, had a local, local beer handle. And I was like, Oh, what, which beer is that from them? And they're like, like, Oh, it's actually, they make it here for us. I'm like, what? Like, yeah, it's brewed here. I'm like, you're not a brewery. Like you, we, they, I'm like, I'm like, I, I was dumbfounded by that. What does that even but, mean? Yes. Yeah, but I, I, I really do get what you're saying here, and I, I think if if a place is willing, like proposes it to you, and you, or, or that you mutually agree upon this being a thing, I, I don't see a huge issue with it. I think that when it does become they make it specifically for us. That's disingenuous. When a brewery just rebrands something, like this we can go to Rogue back in the day, constantly rebranding the same beers over and over again with different uh, new labels. They did it for the American Ale like a bunch of times, and uh, I don't know if that's considered disingenuous or not to the market when you're just putting out the same beer with a maybe with a bicentennial label not bicentennial of the country i remember it was for some like city around there but they they changed up the label for that and the name for that all the time with something different uh even though it was the same beer that was inside of it and it got suckers like me who just liked their bottles uh to be like oh look at this cool new bottle from rogue let me grab this i'm like well this really tastes a lot like this one and that one and this one and they come to find out it is the same beer uh, i i find some of that a little disingenuous but it might I, I be don't a i don't i don't necessarily think that it is disingenuous or wrong i was just interested in your perspective on it because i feel like in these circumstances very often you would in the past and in other circumstances i could see how you can apply this to like the transparency of yes. a brewery and a, and a business of trying to say what you actually are getting. And I, I do have minor qualms myself, or not, not even qualms, worries about presenting these beers in this way. It's not going to stop me from doing it. I, I don't, I never deny if someone asks me, hey, I had your Blondale uh, over at this location. Uh, you make it just for them. I'll, I'll say, well, no. I actually had somebody, there's a, a local uh, kind of, um, 
I guess it's like a, uh, a community, a local community that has like a, a large amount of, of homes and they have rebranded one of our beers for their clubhouse or what have you. And someone says, oh, you ma you make a beer. I ran into them at a gas station or whatever. You make a beer for us. And I said, well, no, <laughs> I, I make a beer called this. You can come to our tap room and drink it as this name. And we rebrand it for for this particular community and try to be as straightforward as possible when I can. But I always, I, I feel like I'm getting away with something in a small way. It, it feels yeah. a little cloak and dagger. I, I get that. And that's why like uh, it, it, I might've been sounding like I'm stumbling over my words because I do think that there's a fine line uh, on that because I am so much about transparency on those things. And I, I, I think we can be as transparent as possible uh, from the, the, the manufacturer side, supplier side, but things might get lost along the the tiers. Uh, the we might tell our distributor like, "Hey, this is going to be called this for this person. They're going to buy, but they're just going to be buying that." And but their rep might tell them like, "Oh yeah, this is for you." Blah blah blah. And then the the bar manager or owner or whoever they know, but then they kind of pass it along differently to their staff or the staff just doesn't hear right. And then they pass it along to the consumer and then it's all blah, blah, blah. And then stuff like that could then end up going to another account who's like, well, you make this for them. Why can't you make it for, and then you got to go through all of that explaining to them. And it, it, it can get messy, messier than it needs to be um when doing that but yeah is it disingenuous depends on how it's worded uh, and mm. depends on like what's being said um but it, i i i want to go back to something real quick uh cuz i i got i got myself off track and uh talking about the whole packaging portion of potentially doing these private labels um we do for a, a hotel resort to private label cans. Uh, they are beers that we do make, but they have their own label. And when doing something like that for them, like they go through volume. They, they do a really good amount of, they are, I mean, I don't think that I'm giving industry secrets. They are our number one account of all of our accounts <laughs> overall. Um, they go through a lot of beer. And, um, like they understood that there's going to be a little bit extra of a premium, uh, pricing on the cases of these things because we have to get different labels made for them. And they, they understand that. And, uh, like that, that gets passed along to the distributor who gets passed along to them and, they they haven't had any issues with that but i mean that is something when when people propose uh i want to have a package like when at first brewery that hotel that we did the pale ale for we did draft and package for them so we had a brand new label for them uh keg uh, kegs that were private for them uh, we didn't sell those to anywhere else and it just it was uh we told them like, Hey, these are going to be things that they're going to be a little bit more expensive than our core products because we got to get labels made just for you. And if we're only ordering those, then we're not hitting minimums on the amount of labels that we're ordering. So it's It might be a buck extra for, for a case for you. And sometimes that might throw a person off and be like, no, 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 no. Uh, but a lot of times they were like, yeah, sure. That that's a cost we're willing to take, but then like, yeah, that's a thing to go along with the that quantity uh, volume uh, that that we initially were talking about. I I on on the surface love the idea of working with local community restaurants, hotels, and doing stuff like that. I I, I wish that we could make more private stuff and, and specific brands for people who wanted to, but it's just not feasible at our size. Like if we were, if we were a seven barrel system, fuck, like I, I, I'd be all for making uh, stuff with them wherever possible. Uh, uh, because 
it's 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 a core ideal of me of of being a part of my community is helping people in my community and if we can all work together i think we build a stronger community and if x restaurant comes to me and wants to brew a beer uh and i got the capacity to do it uh, and they can go through it awesome i'm i'm here for you i'm let's do it let's let's fucking do this and then z restaurant comes through and like fuck yeah let's let's work together i'm all about that shit uh but at a 20 barrel system that's fucking hard to do well i I feel terrible because i've with all the ones that we've done like i said somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 probably 30 total have been pitched maybe 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 we haven't done 20 of the ones that have been pitched to us so we get these inquiries every couple months or so and we're almost eight years old so it happens pretty often and i have early on i spent that time doing my best to try to find some way to get a, a a beer from my brewery into their location and that was a, a sales job hey what can we do to make this work well we probably can't do this because of volume and blah 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 i've now just started coming to the point of going excuse me i'm fighting a little bit of a cold there and having a lot of issues there with my throat uh i i just started being just blatantly honest as straightforward as possible hey before we even have this conversation how much volume can you go through oh you think you can go through two slims a month well we have one option for you it's this if that doesn't work for you here's some other places you can go for this and i've even started going to the breaking down because a lot of these people will talk about package first i had one person tell me well i don't really have a draft system but i do a lot of cases don't I really go- have a draft system you do or you don't <laughs> <laughs> right. it's a binary thing but saying but you know if it is successful i could bring in a draft box but hey listen we go through like four cases of beer a month so like we we can really do some numbers there and I'll just hey listen this is what it's going to look like and hey and by the way when you're talking to the next guy trying to get them to do this here's the questions you want to ask here's the kind of people you should be going to cuz they're more likely to be in the the ballpark of what you're looking for they're more likely to say yes back in the day I mean back in the day it wasn't that long ago but our friend Chip over at Devour right before they closed their doors that's the kind of brewery that would have been perfect to do a private label beer that would sell a couple half barrels a month at most right yeah there are places that can do this stuff for you and i now try to push people in those directions and it doesn't mean they're going to do it because there's other complications involved in it but i do i the people that call me are so excited and sometimes they're uh, my grandfather's recipe from Germany. I want to brew it, and I just want to have it at my my schnitzel restaurant. And I go, everything you're saying is great, but here's the reality of my industry. And unless you're going to pay an ultra premium and get really creative, it's going to be hard to do this. Yeah. When I was in PA working for Moss Mill, we were a one barrel system with three barrel FVs and brights, and we could do stuff like this. Uh, and we did. We, we did uh, a collaboration with a local historical society and uh, made a beer for them and had an event at the, the like, it's like a little museum. And we did a, a cask tapping and like the, they went through two kegs. They only needed it because then we had the rest of it on, on tap at our place and it's gone in two months. We, we did a collaboration with a, a number of local restaurants uh, to where we could split a batch and pretty much like they, they, got, uh, they got four kegs and we get two or something like that. It was so easy to do that on such a small system. And I, I, I loved the hell out of doing that stuff and it helped uh not build that sense in me but reaffirm it in me uh of what i was just talking about a, a bit ago and i i i think but unfortunately i don't think that we have very many of 
those size breweries in the area right now. Like most breweries in our area are at least a seven barrel system. Um, and most of them are probably 10 to 20 barrels. And so some of that can be kind of slim in finding a small brewery that can really work with you in those situations. Yeah. At least in could, this area. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's different all over the country and depending on where you are. And I'm sure somebody who lives in South Florida or Florida in general is screaming the name of 17 breweries that are in yeah. that <laughs> vein because there's just so many up there that we can't keep track. But the thing is that even for those smaller breweries, there's there's considerations, there's time and energy put into something. And the one thing that we haven't mentioned here at all, and this is your your specialty, Mike, and if if our last conversation or so uh, means anything, we should be arguing more because apparently our last episode sparked a lot of debates. Most people calling me an asshole, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm talking about my friends. Too. These are people that know me, but uh, we, we should be more contentious, apparently, because it's more entertaining. But speaking directly of like branding, what is it? Is it bad for us as a brewery to take one of our flagship brands, one of the things that we want front and center people to know? People should know Copper Point Lager. Every time they drink it, they know they're drinking Copper Point Lager. They call it's a call brand, it's Tito's, right? It's whatever, Bacardi. It's, it is a brand that you know you trust. And when you drink it at a bar, then you find it at the store. Now they're drinking your lager and they're, it's called Dave's Special Amber Lager. And they go, I can't find Dave's Special Amber Lager anywhere. I wish I could find this beer in stores. Literally, they know that it's a branded beer that they can get at their local Publix. That that's another thing that can be a you know a little bit of a loss for a brewery. That's uh that's a really good point and one that I don't think that I really have thought of even as it being like you said my if a thing that should be in my wheelhouse and just put on the spot like that I I do feel a little bummed that that could potentially. I don't cost us sounds so so evil and finalized but like it it could it could cost the the consumer the ability to enjoy that beer elsewhere uh, like I mean it, one of the locations that that does a a branding of our our beers is in Delray Beach say someone comes up from Miami for a weekend and goes to that place and has our be has our beer there and like oh yeah this is made by copper point it is our our beer and they're like oh cool i wish that i could get this down in miami well you can it's 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 in total wine it's in whole foods uh, like abc's like you can you can get them get it there but it's not called that thing that you you're, you know it. I don't look at it as as sucking for us so much as it sucks for the consumer. And I, I am like I, I, I am a little bit at a loss for words. So I'm just going through this as I am going through this. Um, well, that's a really I, good question, Kevin. And I'll give you a little more perspective on this. And another, because I, I have thought about this a lot. In that it's not a loss for us in the fact that we would not have had that handle otherwise or that package otherwise. It might not have been there. So it's an opportunity for us to to expand our name. They did hear Copper Point, right? They might not have seen Amber mm. Lager, but they heard Copper Point and they remember that. So that's important. Mm. But if you dissect some of what we said earlier in the conversation and what I mentioned was that if you don't see a huge spike in your house branded beer right if that tap handle was producing we had a country club that rebranded one of our beers and four draft lines that's it right and we replaced a beer another local craft beer and we are now selling about the same exact amount of beer as that handle was selling before there hasn't been a big spike in the amount of sales 
at that location were selling about the same amount of beer. If that's the case, wouldn't it be better for everybody if we just put that beer under its normal name on on the tap handle? Right. There wasn't a big rush for that beer. It did not create buzz. It did not make people want to say, well, I need to have the beer of the place that I'm at or I need to represent my country club. Maybe just having another good beer on draft that's doing well and that the people there from the management to the service can get behind would be enough. And it it's not all it's cracked up to be, so to speak. Now, I know there there are. Uh, there's there's an antithesis of that. And we've had other situations where the house beer is shot up. We have one chain restaurant that is doing tons more business. And uh, our beer is like in the top three when the other two other the other two beers above us are all macro. And we would not be doing it if it weren't the house beer. So I know that there are both those situations. But I think that there is an assumption that is if I put my restaurant, my bar's name on this beer, it will sell more automatically. And I think a lot of times that's not that's unfounded. And we could all just be better off having good relationships with those bars, providing them with a the beer that they like uh, and support them. And then everybody wins. Yeah, uh, exactly. I, I mean there there's some ego that probably comes into play with this like hey we have our own beer then we will sell more of it when like if you're you're not selling a whole lot of beer to begin with yeah what makes you think that something with your name on it will sell you more is yeah that's a tough conversation to tell someone who is probably hard nosed on like yes yes it will but yeah, I mean, I, I lost a little bit of my train of thought, but <laughs> yeah, there, there. I, I think what this comes down to is you're dealing with personalities, personalities that can be very big. Th- these bar managers, owners, whatever, yes. who uh, think very highly of themselves, and maybe rightfully so for what they do as a restaurant, but. There, you need to understand your clientele. You need to understand what they want, what they just saying that we want a, a, a house brand. Our consumers will, will drink it. Doesn't mean that that's what they want. Like your, your consumers doesn't, don't necessarily want something that says like that they're eating your, your, your steak. Sure. Awesome. But that doesn't mean that they're going to drink the beer that has your name on it too. And th- this is about understanding your clientele and knowing your clientele and, and, and really having a good sense of what you can do with it. And, um, it, it, it's, there's, there's so many things that go into these types of conversations and I, and I feel I don't even get to be privy to a lot of them uh, now at this point. Uh, um, uh, luckily, <laughs> prob- probably for the better, because I more often than not am going to cut to the chase very quickly on these conversations and, and say what I said before. Can you go through this much beer? No? All right. Th- th- cool. Go, go do something else. But I do know that this is becoming more of a popular thing. I've heard my boss talk about places coming and, and, and wanting to talk to us. I've heard about our sales rep ha- saying like, this place wants to do this, but this place wants to do that. Uh, my, sometimes my, my first reaction always, because, Kevin, you know, me is fuck off. Like <laughs> it, I, I can be very abrasive for first reactions to these types of things. And that's, it's a character flaw in me. It's part of my, probably my philly upbringing and no Uh, that's that is to my experience and 15 years in this industry that is the typical response to anybody in the beer industry for anything new that's (laughs) fucking stupid it'll never work um (laughs) but i i just i i i'm not against new but i a lot of this 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 private label stuff i have seen it so much that like when someone when someone comes about it, it's just my my first reaction is sometimes an eye roll and then fuck off. 
uh, before I even really know the details. And then I get to find the details and then I'll say fuck off again or well, we could probably swing that. Uh, this, is, this is probably why I'm not in the, the, the absolute public eye with uh, talking to accounts about these things. Like I said, rightfully so. Yeah, it's good. I mean, if, if an account immediately says, hey, we love your beer, we'd love to have a private label, and the first thing you say is, fuck off, it's it's going to really taint the rest of the conversation. I, you know what? I, I should I should probably uh, state that my my saying fuck off is usually to my own coworkers about the situation. I don't say that to the, the to the account or people who are coming to to do it. Like like hey, so and so would like to make uh have us make a beer for them. I'm like oh yeah, fuck off. No, to to my coworkers about that. Mike, whether or not you say it verbally or just think it in your head, you say it with your eyes. I've been in a room with you <laughs> and seen things pitched, and I've looked at Mike's face, and oh, he's saying fuck off. That he's saying it in I, his head. I, I don't know have a what good he's saying. Face, do I? No, you do not. <laughs> All right. So, uh, <coughs> uh, anything else that you want to add into this? Because uh, I, I, I've, I feel like this was a good topic. This, I didn't know how much legs we could get out of it, but it is definitely something new to the show. We haven't talked about it, and I don't know if many of the consumers, even though we are a more, I guess, uh, industry-focused uh, podcast, um, how many people really deal with this? And um, Well, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the fact that we do have a lot of people in the industry that listen to this that can relate, I'm sure. But also, I have I've run into people at Barrel Amongst who have mentioned United We Drink, and they are not in the beer industry. And for the people that are not in the industry, I think it's very interesting for them to understand what this looks like. Because if you take it from a consumer standpoint, if they walk into a place and they see that bar's name as the beer in the brewery or however they present it, they're going to assume that it's made exactly for them. So I, d I think it's interesting for those people to see some kind of window into what could possibly possibly be going on with that brand. So I, I think it's it, it can be illuminating. And there's listen, there's more meat on the bone there. I mean, this is this is a complex situation of branding. I mean, it, we 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 touched on the idea of the complexities that it adds to your brewery and you know one day we can have an entire conversation about production and the fact that what i do in the office these days and everything looks good numbers wise on paper joel and ralph and ben will look at me and go oh yeah well that works out on like the numbers of the barrelage but that's going to take me 72 extra hours this week and unless, unless you're going to create new hours in the day, this isn't going to be possible. And a lot of the things about this topic and making new beers and treating and dry hopping and splitting batches, all that extra time is, is, is everything in our industry. Yeah. Especially with, yeah, with your man pay up. With your manpower and the hours that they work and the pay that they make and so much going on with our just workforce in general now i like this is a topic that i would love to talk with you more about on we've done it in, in private but like this is a, a topic that you and i disagree with a lot uh, well i apparently this has to be the next episode because when we are at each other's throats and you're basically challenging me and and calling me a hack the entire podcast people <laughs> like that like people like when you disagree with me so we, we've we've caught lightning in a bottle let's do it again <laughs> fair enough um all right let's get into let's get into last calls uh the point in the show where we give each other an unspecific amount of time to talk about whatever we'd like unopposed unobjected uninterrupted uh, it can be about beer, it can be about whatever. And I'm going to start things off. I'm going to go back to the well here. Um, I want to talk about my fills for, for one more segment here. Um, because it was a fucking magical ride. And 
it was something i i was uh, the the 2008 world series was the first championship for the city of philadelphia that i got to witness in my lifetime uh and it was it was something else as as a phillies fan and we had an amazing group at that point in time with with Jimmy Rollins and Ryan Howard and Chase Utley and Cole Hamels uh, like that that was a a core group of players that I will remember for the rest of my life and this team was so different it's a different world it's a different game uh than than then and I I can nitpick at the p- parts of the team that we're not quite up to snuff for that, but that would be silly. This is a team that fired their manager a quarter of the way through the season. A, a legendary manager of Joe Girardi and let the bench coach pretty much take over the team and run it and led this team to the playoffs, to the World Series, and... Uh, it was such a fun ride. Yeah, we lost, but holy fuck, was I so enthused. I will remember for the rest of my life the first baseball season that my boys were alive, the Phillies went to the World Series. I will remember Game 5 of the NLCS, Bryce Harper jacking a fucking home run that won them that series and won them a a spot in the world series. And I remember jumping up with joy and running around my living room, kissing both of my boys, kissing my wife, kissing my dog, boys, not knowing what the hell's going on. Dog, absolutely angry at me. Um, yo, big ups to the Phillies, big ups to the city of Philadelphia for, for making this such a fun, fun ride and uh, see what we do next season. Kevin. Beautiful, Mike. Nothing I like more than baseball. Except Weird Al Yankovic. Weird, the movie by Weird Al Yankovic that is a biopic, a parody biopic about his life is out on Roku right now and anyone can watch it you don't even have to like we didn't even have to sign up for anything and put in a password i could just click on the roku app and i could watch weird and it is a tour de force (laughs) it is absolutely freaking incredible it is so funny well written the cast is absolutely amazing and I am a big time Weird Al fan. I grew up listening to Weird Al. My dad was a fan. I've listened to every single album. I'm in. I mean, I'm not just talking about like the superficial, you know, like a surgeon, eat it, uh, Amish Paradise, the deep cuts. I am a Weird Al fan, and this was such an amazing thing for fans because there's so much stuff about his career that's parodying his career in jokes, and Daniel Radcliffe did an incredible job as Weird Al Yankovic, and the fact that he did this movie, the the first movie, I believe, involving Weird Al since UHF, which is a cult masterpiece that I own two DVD copies of, why? Because you never know when one's going to break and you have to have a copy of UHF. But this is the first movie since then, and that was in the, in the late 80s or mid to late 80s when that, when that came out. But it is the perfect movie because it is a parody of music biopics, pictures. And it's just, it's just great. It's, it's just fun. It's playful. And I, I, tying it back to beer just quickly... One of my favorite people in the world to work with in this industry was a, was a gentleman named Morgan Pierce. And I remember having a conversation with him one day, just out of the blue, where I mentioned Weird Al, and I said, Weird Al's a genius. And he said something, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, like, eat it? Really? Genius? I mean, anyone can come up with that stuff. And, and that was like... 20 years ago, I feel like it probably wasn't that long, but to this day, I still have like so many comebacks to it because Weird Al is a freaking musical genius. Lyrically, uh, the musical composition, the pastiche, 
uh, genre where he takes the sounds and the feel of a musician and turns it into an amazing musical parody. The man's great. I've seen him live at least three times. I missed him a couple weeks ago because no one was free to come go and see him with me, and I'm not confident enough to go to a concert by myself. Uh, please uh, support Weird Al Yankovic. I want more uh, material from him. Go to Roku, watch the movie. If you have any kind of enjoyment of Weird Al's material, you will love it. My wife has little to no interest in Weird Al, and she thought it was brilliant as well. So you don't even have to be a big fan to enjoy it. It's really, really well done. I know we don't usually respond, but I did not know that you didn't need a an account or anything for the Roku app. So that makes it because I, I was like I wanted to see that. I'm like, I don't have the Roku I don't have a Roku. I don't have a Roku app. Like I how am I going to see this? But all right. You've just solved something for me. And by the way, there is a possibility that Allie, my wife, signed up for this six months ago and it auto filled something. That's a possibility. So if you get to that point, don't get mad at me. But check Do it get out. Mad at him. <laughs> it, it should it should work for you and yeah it was just really you have to watch commercials but i mean who cares okay cool uh you want to plug anything i think that anyone who is interested or or, li- or i'm sorry lives near a lazy dog restaurant should go and check out check out hop attack if you're not a member of the beer club sign up for it it's a really i mean it's just a great deal the food's amazing it's a it's a great business and uh you can try hop attack which is fantastic also we have a collaboration beer out uh called uh dripping dripping in juice uh with yeasty brews in south florida now, this is only for people who live very local to us. It is not packaged other than uh, small amounts in the tap room. It's a small brewing system. But my brewer, Ralph, uh, worked with Dan over at Yeasty Brews to make a really, really incredible uh, double IPA, hazy IPA. Uh, so I've got two. <laughs> Barrel Amongst has two hazy double IPAs out that were not brewed on our systems that are really, really good that I think people should check out if they're able to. Belgian brewery. Uh, <laughs> Branding, uh, Mike. Branding. Exactly. Um, uh, I want to uh, let you all know, by the time that this uh, episode comes out, the announcement will already be out there. But we are doing our third annual Christmas fundraiser charity with our friends at Bitter Units, raising money for Feeding America on Saturday, December 10th at 8 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. Go over to our YouTube channel and you can watch us. We'll all be hanging out, drinking beer, having fun, raising money for Feeding America. Last year, we raised over $1,300 for them. We are going to set ourselves a goal of $1,500 this year. Hopefully, we can, we can hit that. We're going to come up with some fun little goals. Uh, during this time uh, that hopefully we can do or drink silly things if we hit those goals and uh, we're going to have some some guests on during the the stream Uh, it's going to be a great time if you've if you've been a part of either of the previous streams you know that we've had a great time Uh, if you haven't try to try to carve out some time on your uh, saturday December 10th to hang out with us. Um, we really enjoy it. We're doing something great that we're super fucking proud of. Uh, I, I, I know that this is something that Joel felt very strongly about uh, on his time here, and he's going to come on and join us. I Spoiler alert. Um, but I'm super stoked uh, always about this. That We, we raised over $1,000 our first time, and we were like, hoping that we could raise two, three hundred dollars. Uh, so please help us out. Um, if you go to our website, unitedwedrink.com, we have the details about that on our blog right now. Um, also, all of our social has it. You can make donations right now, and they are open until December the 14th. 
the link is right there on the blog of our website. Uh, so if you can't join us, but you want to donate, you can do so. And we are super appreciative of that. So yeah, we'll see you on the 10th of December. We'll have another episode before then, but this is going to be a fun time and we hope that you, uh, come out and join us. Uh, other than that, be sure to follow the social, uh, for the show at United We Drink on Twitter at United We Drink Pod on Instagram. We are on all of the major podcast streaming services. So if you are new to the show, go ahead and find us on your favorite podcast app. Subscribe to the show so that you get all of the episodes delivered to the device of your choice every other Thursday. And if you would like to support the show financially and help us pay for our hosting fees, uh, go to our website, unitedwedrink.com. Click on the brands that we like. And if you go to any of those links, such as Made in Cookware, Liquid Death, uh, we now are uh, affiliated with our friends at the brewery. Go and buy beer from the brewery in California, if you live in California, and get it delivered to you. Uh, you support the show by doing that. Or if you become a member of their reserve society, they have applications or not applications. They are open for new, <laughs> new uh, members of the reserve. They're very society. discerning. They're very discerning. <laughs> they need several forms of ID. They do a credit check. So be careful. Be careful when you what you get in get involved with. So go over to our site <laughs> and uh, <laughs> apply. They're going to say yes. You send the money. They're going to say yes. Uh, but uh, do that. Or you can buy a shirt, button, sticker, tote from our web store, unitedwedrink.com slash store. All of that goes to just paying for the hosting for our, our website and our, uh, our podcast. Um, other than that, we'll be back in a couple weeks. Have a great Thanksgiving. Eat well. Be safe. Enjoy time with your family, even if you don't like them. Uh, because we're getting into the holiday season, baby. And it's my favorite time of the year. Mine too. Cheers. I don't know why my voice got that high. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>
to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar.